afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Make Way for Gen Z. Uh, before we get started, I'd love to encourage you to get out your cell phone and log on uh, following the instructions on the slide. This is probably the one exception when your phone is meant to be out, your speakers request it. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce David and Jonah Stillman, an awesome father-son duo who are going to talk about Gen Z, what's coming up next. So please join me in welcoming David and Jonah Stillman to the stage. Thank you. Good afternoon. So two and a half years ago, Jonah and I were trying to land a new client and really struggled to get the meeting. I finally get the meeting. And I purposely made it for 3.30 in the afternoon, when at the time Jonah was in high school, I knew he could be at the meeting. Now this is such a good opportunity for us to open up for case studies, research, a lot of speaking opportunities, some cool projects. I was so excited. So we land the meeting, and I tell Jonah, OK, it's at 3.30. I'm coming from somewhere else. See you at the meeting. Great. So I got to the meeting about 3.25. I walk in, and I'm greeted by this lovely woman who says, oh, that Gen Z son of yours, he's so charming, so smart, you must love working with him. Now, part of me was really happy that he had made it to the meeting, but I can't lie, I knew he was going to give me a hard time for beating me to the meeting. So I was like, Ugh. So she walks me down to this conference room, walks in, true story, and I said, so where is Jonah? And literally she says, oh, he's joining us via Skype. I was like, excuse me? <laughs> and Look, there's a laptop on the table, and Jonah's waving at me. Now, I am so mad right now. Didn't say anything. We have the meeting. We get in the car, and I'm still fuming about it. And I call him, and I was like, where were you? He's like, what do you mean? I was like, Jonah, you could have been at that meeting. It wasn't that big of a deal for you to make it downtown. He's like, Dad, I was at the meeting, and I thought it went great. But if you don't mind, I want to talk to you about it later, because I'm trying to get to the gym. <laughs> now I'm like really mad, okay? He says every single time we talk about this, Daddy's over it. Clearly not, because it comes up in every single speech. But <laughs> this is clearly a, a classic example of generational differences, and I always like to know what the audience thinks. So as it was mentioned, we encourage you to use our phones. How often do you get to use your phones at a presentation? So to kick off today, we want to take a quick vote. Who do you think was right in this situation? If you think it was me, click A. If you think it was my dad, click B. To find this, you click on Vote in our app, and there you will find your options. All right, how's it, how's it looking? Uh, give it a second, give it a second. That means I'm winning. OK. Actually, right now it's pretty split. 53% of you say my dad was right. Wow. The other percent say that's pretty good for me. Usually I get blown out of the water on this one. but. Yeah, 53% of you said my dad was right. I'm just really curious. Who in the audience picked me? Raise your hand, anyone. You can just shout. Why did you pick me over there? Yeah. Anyone, either one of you. Why do you think, why did you pick me? Always be there in person at a client meeting if you should be. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, right there. You picked Jonah. Why did you pick Jonah? Yeah, hold on. Uh, before we okay, keep Okay, so she said, just so you, everyone can hear, hold on, that you thought Jonah was right because he obviously knew his audience and she really liked him. That's so he always says he's right, but I'm going to ask a, another question to my dad. Yep. Did we get this client? <laughs> yes, we did get the client. And the underlining reason as right. to why we got the client was? They liked how high tech we were. OK. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. So all right. If we're father and son, we live together, now we've been working together, and we're struggling with this, we can't imagine what's really going on out there. So we get to travel the world meeting with leaders, and again and again, we're seeing little situations like this rise up, and people aren't really sure why, and suddenly they realize there has been a generational shift. And that's what we're here to talk to you today about, as you recruit that younger workforce, all about Gen Z. But to get started, the most common starting places, take a look at who are the generations, and I'm going to break it down for you here. We've got the traditionalist generation, born before 1946, population size of 75 million. Then came the great big baby boom generation, born between 1946 and 1964, population size 80 million. 
Then came Generation X, that's my generation, born between 65 and 79, much smaller, 60 million. And then of course we had the millennials, the children of the baby boomers, the most talked about generation in history, 1980 to 94, 82 million strong, stepping now into leadership, which is pretty cool. But we've got a whole new generation coming, Gen Z, born between 1995, 2012, the leading edge of Gen Z graduated college last spring at 72 million strong. Now, I did just break it down for you here by age, but we've gotta go a lot further than that. If you talk to a lot of generational experts, and this is my 21st year studying the generations, we might not all agree on the exact same birth year. Some may say millennials start in 82, some might say 79. Do not get hung up on birth years. Because the theory behind generational differences is that each generation lives through certain events and conditions that take place during their formative years, so between the ages of 12 and 20. And because they experience these events during those formative years, they adopt a generational personality, a certain lens that they look at the world that they then take with them into every single life stage. So if I talk to a baby boomer and they see images like this during their formative years, they remember, of course, Vietnam, JFK, Martin Luther King, the first television. Very different events that shaped that generation than compared to Gen X. My generation, of course, we had Michael Jackson, cable TV, the first video games, MTV came out. So we were looking through completely different lens, but then again came a whole other generation, the millennials, everything from Facebook to Harry Potter, of course, the tragedies of 9-11. And it's interesting that these events and conditions set a personality that you then take with you. So I'm just gonna give you an example. Can you see a show of hands of my baby boomers who are willing to admit it? Any baby boomers in the room? Okay, a baby boomer. Earliest memory of NASA and space exploration. What do you remember happening as a kid? John Glenn, the moon landing? No, no the, before the moon. Oh, before the moon landing, okay. Around Went around the Earth. What's another big memory? Anyone else remember the moon landing? Oh, most talk. So most boomers will say, I remember where I was, right? Remember where you were, what happened? It was exciting times. It's amazing what NASA could achieve. Government institutions should be upheld because they're creating these amazing opportunities for our country. Okay, park that thought. Where's my Gen Xers in the room? Early memory of NASA, of space exploration in your formative years. That's right. I was in 11th grade. We had been studying the school teacher who went up in space. We all saw what happened play out before our eyes. And suddenly for Gen Xers, institutions were skeptical, government spending, space exploration wasn't a good thing. Now that's just one event that took place in two different generations that resulted in a completely different outlook. Um, and so today what we really wanna do is have you get your arms around Gen Z. Now what I do wanna put out there is that by no means are we here to put anyone in a box. We're not here to stereotype. Does this apply to every single generation? No. But we have uncovered through 20 plus years and now studies on Gen Z that generational personalities do play out in recruiting and retaining the different workforce. Now, the nice thing about generations, it's no different than any other form of diversity, whether it be race, ethnicity, gender. We study all these to understand our employees. But when it comes to generations, there doesn't seem to be too much political correctness yet. So let me ask you a question. For an example, when I say millennials, what terms or thoughts come to people's mind? Anybody? Entitled, okay. <laughs> I think I heard that a bunch of... All right, what'd you say? Self-serving, Self okay. <laughs> Flighty, all right. Millennials, feeling pretty good about yourselves, huh? Okay, I mean, we just put it out there and immediately it's entitled We hear all these negative. Now, the nice thing, you put any other form of diversity up there, people don't talk. So the good thing about the generations is that we do get our thoughts out there, even if they're stereotypes or not, and so that's the nice thing about this topic. Yeah, my dad's right. Across the board, when we travel and speak to so many different leaders, people do not hold back when it comes to talking about generational differences. Now, something else that I've really come to learn is that when it comes to talking about millennials versus Gen Z, boomers versus Xers, people always go to the place of trying to figure out which generation is right, which one is wrong, who's better, who's worse, and we're here to tell you that that will get you nowhere. What you need to understand is that each generation is different. We've been shaped by different formative events. So naturally, we're going to have unique generational personalities. Now, unfortunately, another thing I've realized is that as we continue to travel, it shocks me how many leaders in the business world don't have my generation on their radar yet. Generation Z, we were born between the years 1995 and 2012. The leading edge are already in the workplace, and yet we're only starting to come into the conversation. Now, what most people assume is that they take, let's just say the number 30. Anybody that's 30 and under, they clump us all into one group, and what most people do is say, you're just a millennial. 
And that really is the mistake to be made because we are so different than the millennials. And if you assume we're a millennial, you'll only naturally treat us like them, and that will backfire. It actually happened before. When my generation showed up, Gen X in the mid-90s, people were not ready. Why? 80 million baby boomers had entered the workforce trying to figure out how do we stand out? How do we figure policies and procedures, rules and regulations to navigate such a big group? And we did. The challenge is everyone thought, oh, this works. Gen Xers will behave and think just like us. They tried to treat Xers like the boomers and some of our most costly collisions from communication to recruiting, retention, all because we didn't take the time to get to know this next generation. So the nice thing is, I mentioned the leading edge of Gen Z just graduated. You do get to be proactive. And congratulations to all of you for pioneering this dialogue. When we get calls in a few years, people will be in reactive mode because maybe recruiting numbers are down. But the leading edge is just coming in. Um, for our book, Gen Z at Work, that came out last March, we conducted three national studies on Gen Z, and we recently conducted the first global study on Gen Z's attitudes, and we identified seven key traits of Gen Z, and today we want to talk to you about three of them. So for our third study that we did, together we had the idea to see if anyone else was interested in this topic of Generation Z. So as a 17-year-old senior in high school, I started reaching out to business leaders, CEOs, celebrities, asking them to submit one question they had about Generation Z, and from Oprah to Mark Cuban, Seth Rogen, Ashton Kutcher, Mark Parker, we heard from everyone. Everyone wanted to know about Gen Z. So to kick off our exploration today, let's look at one of the questions we got from Christine Amanpour, who is an international chief correspondent. She asked, do you regard employment as an entitlement or are you prepared to start at the bottom and work your way up? And across the board, we heard from Gen Z, 76% of Gen Zers said that they are willing to start at the bottom and work their way up. Now, I am convinced when I show an audience this, they're like, well, that's all I need to know. Just tell me how to find them, and we can move on to the break. <laughs> but it's really interesting, and it kicks off our first trait we want to talk to you about, and that is this is a very realistic and pragmatic generation. And there's a host of reasons this is, but this is a generation that knows it's going to be hard to get a job and to succeed at it. And one of the biggest influences on this has been the economy. If you take a look at millennials, they were raised during economic prosperity. Things were great. We saw businesses overnight exploding. Their parents were telling them they could be anything they wanted to be. And it was exciting times. You compare that to Gen Z, a lot of their dinner conversations were about companies trying to stay afloat, leaders being called into question, scary times, and not only out in the world, but right at home. During the recent recession, the net worth of their Gen X parents fell by 45%. So in a national study that has been asking teenagers, what are you most concerned about? It's been going on for years. So they asked millennials, what's your number one concern? And at the time, what they say? Am I popular? Even more specific, it was right when Facebook was launching. So they said, no, do I have a lot of friends on Facebook? Makes tons of sense for a teenager. That's what they were worried about. So then the survey was conducted 18 years later with Gen Z. And they said, Gen Z, what are you most concerned about? The number one answer, the economy. So in just one generation, we went from typical teenage things like, am I popular, to now we have a generation that was really worried about the economy and what it's going to take to get ahead. So a great and a really simple visual to help understand this key difference between the millennial generation and Gen Z is if you take something as simple as the entertainment industry. At a young age during their formative years, millennials were given Harry Potter arguably one of the most successful book and movie series of all time. This amazing concept where teenagers could dream of escaping to this world where you had a wand, you told spells, there was a game, you flew around on brooms. What did us Gen Zers have? We had Hunger Games. <laughs> Post-apocalyptic, one versus the world, you don't win, you die. If you really sit down and think about it, it is an incredibly messed up concept, but yet weirdly entertaining. <laughs> Across the, board, across the board, my generation, Gen Z, we are in survival mode. We are really focused on what it'll take to get ahead in life. We are looking at different ways to survive and even thrive. And this survival mode mentality is especially true for those Gen Zers that are growing up in the poor or middle class. But our research shows that even affluent Gen Zers are very aware of the world we live in today. And, that, and they know that even after you go to college, you are definitely not guaranteed to have a job. Our parents didn't necessarily tell us that we could be the next president or an astronaut. They were very clear with our generation at a young age that this isn't such a pretty world and you've got to fight for what you want. It's interesting, I mean, you even said it right here, when millennials, and I wrote my book about the millennials in 2007, 
It was interesting. Everyone said, God, this generation comes across as so entitled, so entitled. But in due fairness, we have to look at how they were raised, okay? When a millennial went to apply for a job, and if they got the job, what did their parents say? Oh my goodness, that company is so lucky to have you, right? <laughs> okay, and if they didn't get the job, what did their boomer parents say? Oh my God, they're idiots. They have no idea what they're missing. You know, another company will come along and they'll be much smarter. Our Gen X parents were saying, hey, you got a job, now don't go screw it up. <laughs> Very true. We are much more realistic with this generation. So this survival mentality is changing things. First and foremost, what are they looking for in a job? Now, I just told you, I wrote about the millennials. When millennials entered the workforce, the number one thing they wanted was meaning. Here's a generation that said, you know, I just, if I'm going to go work eight hours a day, I better be moving the needle on something, right? They also had baby boomer parents who were burning out at the time, and they said to their kids, look, if you're going to work as hard as I've worked, just promise me you're going to do something you really care about. That's awesome. The challenge was that millennials showed up at work, and from day one, they wanted to be Gandhi. And we're like, well, your job is to answer phones. I don't know, but like, they want to light the world on fire and do so many cool things. Now, what Gen X tells, Gen Z rather, tells us is, sure, they want meaning like everybody, but I might find it a host of ways. I know I've got to work and I've got to earn in order to survive. And this came out loud and proud, truly, on our survey. We had Dave Gilboa, the founder and CEO of Warby Parker. He emailed us and he said, David and Jonah, what's the most important factor when choosing an employer for Gen Z? We ran the survey, <laughs> top answer, pay and salary. Dara Kasrochahi, CEO of Expedia and now um, Uber, he said, what are the top reasons Gen Z would stay at a company for more than five years? Top response, pay or salary. So clearly this generation wants meaning, but they're putting a premium on earning again. So pay and salary, top of the list. Now being in survival mode hasn't just opened up Gen Z at a young age to the importance of money. It's also making us question, what is the best path for me to be successful? The very traditional path, as everyone known, knows, has always been you go to college, you get a degree, and you get a job. And that's just how it's been done. However, for the first time in history, you have an entire group of kids challenging this. 75% of Gen Z said that they believe there's ways of getting a good education other than by going to college at all. Now, this can come down to a few different things, whether it's the DIY mentality, but at the end of the day, it comes back to money. We are terrified about drowning in college debt. 67% of Gen Zers indicated their top concern is being able to afford college. So how is that playing out? We now have a generation that says, well, if I'm going to go to college, I better know what I'm going to study. Now, that's very different because you used to go to college to figure that out. You used to go to college to figure out your career. But now we have a generation where 61% of them said, I better know what career I want before I even go to college. So at a young age, they're trying to figure out what should I do with my life. Now, Jonah has an older sister. She's a junior at Miami of Ohio. And when I took her to look at schools, what did she say to me? She said, Dad, I want to be an eighth grade algebra teacher. I'm like, how do you know that? <laughs> and she's on her path to do that. But when I think about when I entered college, my first stated degree was forensics. I had a brief stint in medicine, and naturally over four years, I got a degree in journalism. <laughs> That's just what you did. How many extras out there took that path? You came in, exactly. We sort of found our way. It's interesting, though, but college right now, they're in trouble. A lot of higher ed, when they call, they're in reactive mode because the value proposition has really had to change. It used to be, come discover yourself, and we'll help you find your way. And we would go, and we'd spend the time. But now we have a generation, I'm only going to go if I know. As Gen Z applies to colleges, the new value proposition that's really connecting with us is the one that's saying, hey, you know what you want. We can get you there in X amount of time at this cost a very realistic statement in order to get us to go to college. Now another thing that I've started to realize is that as we continue to travel and have these focus group with business leaders, and I ask them, you know, you're getting a lot of these new Gen Z recruits, where are you getting them from, what did they study? And they have a blank face. They don't even know where they went to college. They don't know what degree they had. But something I do continue here is the importance of work experience. Leaders are now starting to hire people that have work experience instead of those important uh, higher ed degrees. Most companies are trying to get on Gen Z's radar. Now that they realize that we're the new recruits, we're the next employers, they're scrambling to figure out how to get on our radar. And the number one way you do that is still internships. It's a great way to introduce us to a brand and expose us to your work culture. But cutting edge companies are not just looking at college students for internships, 
they now know that if we know what we want to do before we go to college, they got to be on our radar before we go. So they're now trying to tap into the juniors and seniors in high schools, bringing them in for stretch assignments, special projects, field trips. They are really taking the time to get on our radar as early as possible. So many people will say to me, my God, an 18-year-old worried about what they want to be, and now they're trying to get professional experience. What happened to working at the grocery store? And it might be true. They might feel that this generation is growing up too fast, but it isn't all doom and gloom, because we have a generation that's willing to roll up their sleeves and work. As parents, though, Gen Xers, we have to own some of this. 55% uh, of Gen Z high school students feel pressured by their parents to gain early professional experience. So their parents are saying, don't go work at the grocery store, go get professional experience. But like I said, it's not so bad. They're willing to roll up their sleeves and work. I love what Katie Couric asked us. She said, David and Jonah, how committed is Gen Z to sticking around a company if their roles continue to grow? 75% said they'd be willing to stay with a company. However, just because we are willing to stick around doesn't necessarily mean we will. Now a key aspect to Katie's question is the point where she said, if your roles continue to grow. Now hopefully our willingness to stick around will alert companies and say, maybe it is worth it to invest in this generation when we also know that Gen Z is willing to stick around for a long time. 61% of Gen Z is willing to stay with the company for 10 years. I love this question we got from the founder of Jimmy John's, Jimmy John, he said, is Gen Z willing to work longer hours and harder than their fellow Gen Z rock stars to reach their goals? And 88% of them said yes. So a lot of this taps into what we've been talking about, being a realistic generation about what it's going to take to get ahead. But it also leads us to our next trait we want to talk to you about. This is one driven generation. And sure, the economy has cost, made them dr have a big drive. But this trait of being driven was instilled in Gen Z long before the recent recession. Yeah, the other huge important aspect to being a driven generation is our parents. Our Gen X parents instilled this driven mentality into our minds at a very young age. If you look at the way boomers interact with their millennial kids, it's very similar to the way that we interact with our Gen X parents. We both have a really tight bond with our parents. We bond over similar things, and overall we just have a really good relationship. However, just because my generation and the millennial generations both had close relationships with our parents does not mean in any way that we were raised the same way. Boomers, for example, raised the millennial kids in something that we call the self-esteem movement. They wanted to remind their millennial kids that they were the best at what they did in every aspect of life. Whether it was folding the laundry, they were reminded that no one folds laundry like them. If they aced the math test, they were the smartest kid in the state. They were the smartest kid in the world by that means. And also, they were given that famous participation award. The message was <laughs> loud and clear that if you worked hard, at the end of the day, you are a champion and you are the best. And God forbid you actually had to be the best at anything because the boomer parents, no matter what they did, just told them that they were the best. Not this guy. <laughs> Classic Gen X parent. My dad, I'm not joking you, when I was a kid, I vividly remember always him telling me that if anyone gets a participation award, it's him because he got me there and we were on time. <laughs> Gen Xers really don't agree with the message that if we work hard, we can be winners. I was told, and all other Gen Zers were told at a young age, that there are winners and there are losers. And I'm going to tell you a really fun story about how this plays out. I remember my very first car ride to my first baseball game. We had been practicing. I was so excited. I had my eye black on. So I get in the car. We're backing down the driveway. My dad stops the car. He turns around to me and says, all right, look. This is exciting, it's your first baseball game. When you get up to the plate, if you strike out, that's fine. But next time, you better hit the ball. You got around the bases, you got to score in order to win. And I know you can beat the other team. I'm sitting there, I'm itching in my skin, I'm so fired up. He starts playing Eye of the Tiger. Now I'm just bouncing in my seat. I am ready, we arrive at the baseball field. I jump out, I'm throwing fists, I am ready to win. And we are greeted by lovely Coach Rob. Okay, let me tell you about Coach Rob, all right? Ends up that the speech I gave Jonah on the way to the baseball field was a no-no. That was out. I was ready to kick baseball butt, but apparently we don't do that anymore. He's greeted by Coach Rob, who's a baby boomer, and walks up to Jonah and says, Hey, little buddy, welcome to the Sidewinders. Here's how it works. You get to swing and swing and swing to get the ball. We don't do three strikes. Evan will get a turn at bat, and then go in the outfield, and the other team comes up. We don't do three outs, so it wouldn't be fair, because not everyone gets a turn at bat. I'm like, whatever. <laughs> and then he actually says, and Jonah, you remember, league rules, we don't keep score. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean we don't keep score? 
so that whole conversation, I was just praying, oh my, I, was just, I didn't want him to say anything to the guy. Please don't say anything, please don't say anything. <laughs> so the coach walks away, he didn't say anything, and I'm like, oh, this is a little bit different than what I thought. So I start walking to the dugout, my dad stops me and he says, I'll be keeping score. <laughs> He does love to make fun of me about this, but it's something big that Gen X parents have worked on. We've really downplayed this notion of participation award and really tried to instill this notion of you gotta fight to win. And this generation is so competitive, the most competitive generation we have seen since the baby boom. The baby boom generation I thought would be the most competitive generation ever, 80 million, but this generation is in it to win it. They want to compete. We know that 73% of Gen Z feels competitive towards others they work with. We never saw those millennials. Millennials, we could all be winners, we could all pitch in together, but this generation wants to win. Now, just because they have a drive and they're gonna really fight hard to be winners, what I also love about this generation and studying them, not at any cost. They'll say, I wanna win and I wanna fight hard, but I gotta be honest with you, it needs to be fair. I've just seen too many leaders called into question for greed and get in trouble. So we want to win, but we're not cutting corners. And this came out in our survey. Paul Pullman, the CEO of Unilever, said, what are the values that drive you most? What did Gen Z say? Honesty. Martin Sheen, he wrote to us, he said, in one word only was the essential characteristic of a leader. And across the board, the number one answer was fairness. So here's a generation that wants to fight hard, but they also definitely, definitely want to keep it fair and honest, which I think is great. Now it's interesting to me, we see so many companies pitching to this generation, right, trying to recruit, and they use messages like, come join our team. Very collaborative culture, you're gonna get along great, you'll meet lots of people. You know, who do you think that really resonates with? Millennials, right, the most collaborative generation ever. For this generation, sure they want to be part of a good team, but you gotta be talking about, around here, only the best rise to the top. You want to talk about a competitive culture where they are going to be able to pull ahead of the rest because that's what they're going to definitely sign up for. And what I would also say is too many times a company wins a big award and they don't talk about it. You know, it's not nice to brag. I would tell you brag. If you're winning awards, brag about them so they know that they're definitely joining a winning team. Now, I do think that boomers are going to love this competitive drive. They tell us again and again a little less focus on everyone getting along and more focus on getting results. And this generation is gonna do that. However, I do think there's gonna be some clashes with this competitive generation. This generation, one thing we're hearing early on is that they're tending to be what we call knowledge hoarders. And the way they're doing that, they hang on to knowledge because if I know something that no one else knows, then you know, I'm gonna be able to keep my job. I'll be really important. It's gonna give me a competitive advantage. Makes sense. We actually saw this with the baby boomers years ago. As millennials entered the workforce, what interestingly happened is a lot of boomers felt threatened. So what did they do? They held on to knowledge because then they would you know, be able to keep their jobs. The challenge that played out though ultimately is when boomers did retire or they moved somewhere else, a lot of that knowledge was gone. So we've got to be careful with this generation that they still are going to share knowledge. And the ones who might not be expecting this are millennials. Millennials are just natural collaborators. They're great at sharing everything with everyone and might just assume that Gen Zers are as well. Look at the way we use social media compared to other generations. Millennials launched Facebook, an application where you can share everything with anyone at any time. It makes sense for a very collaborative generation. Suddenly, all your information was out there for the world to see. Us Gen Zers, we're not into it. It's much, it's too public for us. You know, we don't find the need to let everybody know that we just caught a big fish at our cabin or you know, we're having a great weekend at the farm with our friends. It's much too public for us. So what do we do? We adapt new applications. Who knows what right now the favorite app amongst Gen Zers is? Shout it out if you know it. Snapchat. Snapchat, perfect. Think about it. It's a private application. I click who gets to see what I'm sending, how long they can see it for, and after that, it vanishes. Now, I have to give, this isn't something, this privacy notion isn't something that we came up with by ourselves. It's instilled to us once again by our Gen X parents. At a young age, they told us, you gotta be careful what you put on the internet. Once it's up there, it's there for good, and you don't know what's gonna come back to haunt you. So naturally, we will adapt new ways to communicate in a more private way. Now, it's gonna be one thing if they don't share what they're doing over the weekend, but it's another if they're truly not sharing key knowledge with their colleagues and coworkers. It's something for everyone to keep an eye on because they feel if they hold that, it gives them a competitive advantage when we need them sharing key information with their colleagues. Now the bottom line here is that as Gen Z continues to enter the workforce, we are gonna be working with millennials more than anyone. They will be our frontline managers and they're likely gonna assume that we're gonna enter the workforce 
being naturally as good at collaborating as them. And to be honest with you, that really probably won't be the case. Because we're so focused on self-achievement, we're very driven and we're very competitive, we're not going to be naturally as good as collaborating as millennials. Now, in the way this will play out is that Gen Zers, when we're working with our colleagues, it's going to be hard for us to share all that information with us because, like I said, we're so competitive. The ideal situation for a Gen Zer, because you know, we don't like being judged on teamwork, we want to be judged on our own work. We're scared that if I'm with a team and they do something bad, that that'll come back to haunt us. If, if a Gen Zer could write it out in a perfect world, I think the work world would look something like the show Survivor, where you could kind of, at the end of the week, vote off the dead weight and kind of go along with your own merit. <laughs> but I can see as a millennial where this is going to come off as not a very good trait of Gen Z, because they're likely going to label us self-centered, not good collaborators. And to be honest with you, it's not necessarily true. This is just an area where we will definitely need mentoring. We're going to need to be reminded, coached, and taught on the benefits and why it's important to work in a group, to think in a group, and to share your ideas and not just keep everything to yourself. And for those Gen X parents out there that are rolling their eyes like, oh my god, they're so competitive, they're dry, they need to share, as this commercial reminds us, we raised them. Let me see that. Participation trophy. But we, we won every game. Why do we get the same trophy as all those teams we beat? Are we going to start ending games with hugs instead of handshakes? No. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Here you go, champ. Thanks. <laughs> all right. So for our next trait that we're going to talk about, we're going to kick it off by playing a little bit of trivia. So jump back into the app, click on trivia. There should be one quiz available for you. It is labeled FOMO, and we will give you a few minutes to do that. And the way this works is you're not only being judged one on if you get it right, but how fast you answer it, and you are playing for a prize. Who and is in first place? The winner of the first trivia quiz is Biggie Smalls. Biggie Smalls Where's in the Biggie room? Where's Biggie Smalls? Over there, congratulations. I come up afterwards. What you have won is, we call this a Dootopia card. And you go to dootopia.com, you enter in this code, and you get to give $10 to the charity of your choice. Yeah. All right, be right, though. Before we go on, I'm curious, who is in ninth place? Ninth place. One, two, three, four. Nancy, where's Nancy? Nancy, in honor of our millennials, a participation ribbon. <laughs> hey! Yeah, come up and get it. There we yeah. go. <laughs> and she is a millennial. How yeah. great is that? All right. All right, so the first question you saw there was what does FOMO stand for? Shout it out. That is our third trait that we are going to talk to you about today. Gen Zers, we have an intense fear of missing out. Some stats to prove this we know that 65% of Gen Zers sleep with their smartphones on or near their beds. And I found out that that is just shy of the number of married couples sleeping together. So, uh, OK, how about this? How many hours a day? They're spending four and a half hours a day on their smartphones. So this is a generation that's not surprising, is always connected. They're connected. When they want to know something, they pull out their phones, they refresh who's going to prom with somebody, the score of a sporting event, what's going on in the world. If they want to know, they pull up their phones and they refresh. Now, it's a lot of pressure because they feel like they need to stay on top of everything. But with four and a half hours a day, they're doing a pretty good job. But what happens is when they can't feel connected or they don't feel like they're up to date on something, it actually creates diagnosed anxiety. And that's what FOMO is all about. So they always need to feel connected. A couple of stats that were not in your uh, trivia, but we did in our survey. One in 10 Gen Zers would rather go three days without refreshing their underwear than their Twitter feed. <laughs> And get this one, for any of you working in benefits, when asked about a benefit on the job, they told us 40% said working Wi-Fi would be more important to them than a working bathroom. <laughs> so this generation needs to stay connected. The first thing that I deal with when talking to leaders about Gen Z's FOMO and how we're always on our phones is the message that they say is, put your phones away, keep them away, I don't want to see them. And I'm here to tell you that, unfortunately, if that's the message you're giving out, 
it's not going to work anymore. And that's not to say that there's mentoring to take place on. There's definitely times and places where your phone shouldn't be out. If somebody's in front of you presenting important information, or if it's a team meeting, you likely should be paying attention and you're not, shouldn't be on your phone. But I don't think that's necessarily just a Gen Z problem. Who here, raise your hand if you're willing to admit it, would say that they've been on their, on their phone in the workplace on a time when they probably shouldn't have? Raise your hand. Look around, everybody is raising their hand, so this is not just a Gen Z problem. And another aspect to this is leaders in the workforce now need to realize that we have an innate ability to use our phones in ways that other generations have not been able to. This is not necessarily just a distraction for us, we see it as just another computer, it is simply a resource in our pocket. And a story I have to prove this is that I work for a company called Blackboard, I'm on their advisory board, I'm their youngest member, I'm their Gen Z voice, and Dating back now to last February, I was 17, I was going to my very first board meeting. It was a full day worth of meeting, 12 hours, and I was actually pretty nervous. I was asking my dad, is there anything I need to know beforehand? And he just said, you know what, just for the first couple hours, look around, see what everybody else is doing, and just go with the flow. So I took that message. The day comes, the first presentation begins, a guy comes in and he's talking about last year's numbers and how we can increase engagement, and I see that everyone in the room starts taking notes. So naturally, I took out my phone and I begin taking notes. The guy presents for about an hour. He concludes and everybody goes out into a break and I'm feeling pretty good about myself. I have some points written down as to how I think I can help. And I, you know, I, I was riding pretty high. I said, you know, I didn't stand out and I got some important points, not bad. Then that's when I was greeted by a VP named Craig. He walked up to me and said, hey dude, uh, I saw that you were on your phone during that presentation. If you wouldn't mind just keeping it away, I'll give you some time to check your Twitter feed and you can text your friends afterwards, but just, just keep your phone away during the presentations. So naturally, ooh, I heard that. <laughs> so naturally, I went from feeling really good to not so good. And I was actually really bothered by this for a couple reasons. One, I was super embarrassed. It was my first board meeting. And to, in his eyes, I disappointed him. But it really made me think that he naturally assumed my phone was only a distraction instead of a resource. Now, when Jonah told me this, he, like he said, he was really rocked. And I said, you know, I got to bet a lot of people are dealing with this. You should write about this. So not only did he write about it, but the New York Times published his story on a Sunday last spring. I'm not texting, I'm taking notes. And what was so interesting about this article was that the week following it, I'm not lying, we had so many emails literally from people around the world. Many saying, oh my God, this happened to me, how embarrassing, I get it. But a lot of people said, thank you. You know what, Jonah, I've always, I'm one of those people who thought phones were a distraction. So we can't just assume that phones are a bad thing and they're always playing games at the same time. We do have to make sure that they know the importance of a digital detox. This generation, I love hearing parents who say no phones at the dinner table, or certain meetings where we say there's no phones allowed. We are going to have to do that with this generation, but at the same time, as Jonah mentioned, we can't just assume that the phones are always a distraction either. Um, so because of FOMO, another aspect of Gen Z's ideal work space and workplace attitude is that we feel that we need to constantly be moving or we are missing out. Now complicating this is if you add in the factor that we only have an eight second attention span. It's important to point out though that this doesn't mean you have an entire generation of flaky ADD workers that aren't willing to sit down and focus. What this means is that our brains and the way we work, we've been conditioned to process information a lot faster. A Gen Zer can look at something, process it, categorize it, and implement it much faster than other generations because we've been trained to learn in sound bites. At the same age, millennials had a 12 second attention span, which means that in just a few short years, we've managed to shave off 30% of that time. So like I said, this doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing, it's not that we can't focus, we just have an ability to process at a much faster rate than other generations. Uh, with this generation, because they have that short attention span and they where they're missing out, one area this is really impacting is career paths. So here's a generation that's, they're like sharks. If I'm not moving forward, I think I'm gonna die. So they wanna be moving forward at rapid speed at all times. But this isn't new. I really have to hand it to the millennials. The millennials, when they entered the workforce, thought the same thing. They want to be moving fast. And they said to their leaders, I don't get it. Why is it based on tenure here? Why do I have to put in three years before I'm promoted? If I master this in three months, three weeks, like just promote me. And they really did push it to make it more skills-based and not tenure. And I'd be willing to bet a lot of boomers and extras in this room would say millennials' career paths have moved at a much faster pace than theirs ever did. So now we have a generation that's gonna take that even further. It's not just about pace. They're saying, because they're worried they're missing out, I'd be interested in having multiple roles at the same time. In fact, 75% of Gen Z is interested in having multiple roles within one place of employment. 
and this is even bigger around the world, 80% in the Europe, India, Indonesia, Nigeria, China, these places around the world where we've been surveying, it's even higher. They're interested in having multiple roles at one time. My generation will see no reason why we can't be in programming Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, and then product design Thursday and Friday. By working multiple roles, it's almost impossible to feel like you are missing out on anything. And this is why we're starting to see small to medium-sized businesses have a leg up when recruiting new recruit Gen Zers because they tend to be a little bit less siloed. They say you can wear multiple hats around here, you can bounce around, compared to a lot of big companies where you have one specific role and you don't have a lot of fluctuation in your day-to-day -day assignment. Now, because we suffer from FOMO, like we talked about, by working in multiple roles, we will not feel like we are missing out. And if you're sitting here thinking about your company and you're saying, oh my god, I can't do that at my business, that's totally fine. We understand that this situation isn't possible for everyone, but then look for ways to expose us to every aspect of your business, whether it be rotational groups, outreach assignments, expose us to as many or aspects of your business as possible. A final aspect to FOMO is around this notion of innovation. Every company we go to in every single industry will tell us, we innovate, we innovate. Innovation is our key. It's everyone's buzzword. And that's smart, especially for Gen Z. If you're worried you're missing out, you want to join a company that's definitely innovating. But the challenge is they go about innovation differently than the rest of us. I'll never forget, Jonah came to me when we started, he says, Dad, we're going to add an, an app in our speech. I want people pulling out their phones. I was like, yeah, I don't know. Audiences want to sit there. Do they really want to do trivia and vote? He's like, we're doing it, we're doing it. And I didn't want to squelch his ideas to innovate. So I said, all right, let's give it a go. I said, I'm going to put together a project plan. So I sat down with Jonah. I had the plan laid out. I said, OK, here's how it works. We're going to start off. We're going to interview some clients and maybe even some meeting planners and see what they think. I'd like to do some research into other speakers who have got apps. We'll do a budget. We'll find a developer. And then we'll do a little bit of a prototype. I, w I was sitting in this meeting, if you don't mind. I, w I, was, I was dying. I was thinking <laughs> to myself, oh my god, I'm ready to go. Let's just do this. Innovation for a Gen Zer is two steps. Truly, when you suffer from FOMO, the last thing you want to do is wait too long. So innovation for my generation, step one, you think of it. And step two, you go and make it. It's not enough to now say you innovate as a brand. Gen Zers are taking it one step farther and saying, who is innovating fast enough? Now, I do think my generation will be great in pushing and streamlining a lot of processes because of this FOMO. What we hear from this generation is they think the rest of us overthink things. They find our innovation process to be linear with lots of steps and take too long. So you may say you innovate, but then you talk to a Gen Zer and they don't think you do at all. So we're going to have to connect the dots with this generation. Now that being said, there is a downside to letting FOMO drive the innovation process. We can't always just go think of it and go make it. We have checks and balances for a reason. We're going to have to mentor them that you know, some things take time. Now if your answer is, well, that's the way it's always been done, that's not going to be good enough because they're going to want to streamline. But at this generation, we'll have to learn that there's checks and balances. Um, I loved seeing this from Intuit, and a lot of companies have it. 10% of unstructured time, and they're really encouraging their employees to use these. Why? So that they can innovate. Now, it's interesting, when we share these, and I know a lot of companies offer them, uh, Gen Z is like, oh my god, what do you do? You stare at the wall? Like, that doesn't feel very productive to me at all. Where the rest of us love this notion of unstructured time to innovate, they don't feel this productive. And so it's interesting is they feel that being productive means you're moving quick at all times. So one thing we need to mentor them is sometimes we don't have to be so fast. I give you an assignment, I'm okay if you think about this for a couple days. Ruminate on it, it will not come natural. You give them an assignment, they're gonna think they need to get it done in an hour. And so you need to mentor them that some things do take time, and you're OK with that. You're willing to invest the time, because it won't come natural to them. And again, what we don't want to have happen is we act too quickly and do what Gen Z wants, only for it to backfire, like we see play out in this commercial. Yo, bro, you on woo-woo? You kidding me? Everybody's on woo-woo. Woo-woo. Lock and load, people. We're going all in on Woo Woo. Okay? Mark, comp us up a profile page. Copy. Susie, write us some posts. I'm writing. Grace, upload some videos. Uploading. I want sponsored Woos. I want targeted Woos. We want to be all up in your Woo Woo feed. Gordon, register our Woo Woo handle. Don't you know the uh, Wu Tang clan? Let's get them involved. We need an ethnically ambiguous Woo Woo mascot. We're cashing in the Q4 budget, people. And we're buying some followers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah! Woo! 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 
Are you still on Woo Woo? Nah, man. My mom's on Woo Woo. <laughs> so hopefully, in this last amount of time, you can see that Gen Z's had their own events and conditions that shaped them, resulting in a different personality that we all need to get to know. I did love this question from Seth Rogen. He said, you know, what makes Gen Z happy? And the top response is being with other people. A lot of times, people accuse this generation of being hiding behind their phones. Yet they want to be with other people. In our survey, when we asked them, your preferred mode of communication, and this shocks people, 84% of Gen Z said face-to-face. -face. Everyone assumes I should text them. But they've seen too many leaders called into question, too much inauthentic leadership. They want to look people in the eye. I also love this question from Jeff Wiener, CEO of LinkedIn. I love his question. He said, David and Jonah, 20, 30 years from now, looking back at your career, what would Gen Z like to say they accomplished? I was able to give my family a good life. And I think what we have to realize here is that generations in general, we all want the same thing. Who wouldn't want this? We just might go about it differently. And now we've got a whole new generation coming in, and I think we've got to be careful that we don't go to this place of judging Gen Z. Are you right or wrong, better or worse? They're just different. And hopefully today you've learned about it and you can be proactive. Thank you so much for having us. Woo!